Let me tell you about Jagged Little Pill. After completing a two-record deal with MCA Canada and graduating high school, Alanis Nadine Morissette moved away from her family home in Ottawa, where she met producer and songwriter Glenn Ballard, who had an immediate connection to Alanis. The two decided to work together on her next project in each prospect. After spending a long process writing and recording demos for this album in his home studio in California, the two started shipping it to labels in hopes of getting signed to flesh out these demos in a professional setting. The sonic direction was different than her first two albums, but felt sonically embedded to the sounds of the time, with the writing in a similar attitude, and after getting picked up by Maverick, the two ironed out the kinks of their demos by adding more accompaniment to some songs and a full bands to others. Upon release, it became her colossal success that throttled her into stardom once it caught the airwaves in 1995 and sort of acted as a piece of a bridge in sounds in the alternative rock and pop realms. It is the record-setting alternative juggernaut and a record very dear to my childhood heart. Her first internationally released record, Jagged Little Pill. So like I said up at the top, this album is very near and dear to my little heart. I get nostalgic for this record. Because growing up, I listened to this album a shit ton with my mom, and I don't know if it's because Alanis and my mom are literally like a month apart in age, and the lyric just kind of hit her because I had a very young mother, and she kind of came of age as a mother, and so that sort of burst of independence and, and a need to... Uh, thrive because she had a kid just helped this helped or not but this record is one that I see a lot of the reasons why it was super successful and I appreciate those qualities about it uh, for the same reasons a lot of people do a lot of the pairings of acoustic and electric guitars like on all I really want and on hand in my pocket and a lot of good marriages of those sounds of electric and acoustic that again I feel like was very indebted to where trends in alternative rock were going at the time I mean you think about the sounds of, a, of a, a alternative rock in like 95 96 97 it was all shifting towards its direction in a way that sort of transcended a lot of the grungier aspects that were very popular in the years prior but I think this album excels above that because not only is it produced very well but the writing on this record is fantastic like i said there's a lot of empowering writing on here or a yearning for something better like on all i really want which is like seeking sort of intellectual compare you know, like companionship you know the the bridge of you know enough about me let's talk about you for a minute enough about you let's talk about life for a while you know that see that that needing of something a little more than the surface level is i think important and while All I Really Want has this sort of general sense of empowerment to it, and one could get empowerment from tracks like You Want to Know, or Right Through You, or Perfect, I feel like the focal point was, and it's not just because she's a woman, but the way she, the, these songs are framed, it, especially Right Through You, it's meant to be a sort of female empowerment. And I think that's important, and I think that again, in the era that it was written, it works so very well, because in the mid-90s, we had the boost of female empowerment acts and a lot of pro-woman music coming out, you know, festivals like Lil Affair were happening, and I feel like this record was sort of definitely at the forefront of a lot of that, and I feel like Exceeds, where some of those albums may falter, because not only those songs with songs like You Ought to Know, having this female sexual, like embracing female sexuality, but also spitting in the face of those that try to objectify that, like right through you, um, and tracks like Perfect that are about parents and how you may have had this sort of conflict with them, or trying to cope with your own sort of emotional shortcomings, like on Head Over Feet, or again, tapping into that general sort of help or empowerment, like on You Learn, or again, yearning for something more to self-empower, like on All I Really Want. But it pairs that with the sort of 90s obsession with postmodernism and playing it straight, like on um, Hand In My Pocket, which is just a bunch of songs written, or a bunch of lines written as uh, being counter-culture, as a counter-culture person, you know, but you've also just got your hand in your pocket, and you're flicking a cigarette, or you're playing a piano, or throwing up a peace sign, or, you know, the, the song that has been the subject of many memes, ironic, uh, because nothing in it is truly ironic. College Humor had its parody song about it, and I think that that, in tandem with a lot of those empowerment songs are what helped this album stay relevant over the years and what 
is made it a classic in a lot of people's eyes. Like, I have a nostalgia for it. I listened to this album when it came out, and I, I hold it near and dear to my heart because of the memories it's, it's given me. But I also still really enjoy this, not just from the lyrics or the production, but I think that, that as a whole, this package is just fucking great. I'm also a fan, though, of 90s postmodernism and 90s uh, alternative rock, and I love that this is a brilliant marriage of so many different facets in the alternative realm, because you have you know, the, the pairing of a, uh, electric and acoustic guitars, like what was going on a lot in the scene. You have the pro-female lyrics, like I had already mentioned, a lot of the self-help lyrics that I think are really nice and, and optimistic in a good way. But I love how it pulls from so many different things. It's got catchy hooks. It's got the the, the guitar pairings, like on uh, All I Really Want, or just a handful of the record, Hand in My Pocket, the chorus of Right Through You, I love the, the harmonica on Hand in My Pocket and All I Really Want. I love that they, they threw in harmonica and give it the sort of mid-90s feel of bands like Counting Crows and Hootie and the Blowfish. But again, it sort of stands in its own lane because it has production ideals that those records don't even touch. I love that it has this aggressive moment that doesn't really fit um, as a whole, a new ought to know. Like, it's a great song, but it is like this apex of aggression that I really love, and I think that it's... It's, it's executed masterfully. A lot of this record is executed masterfully, and I think it helps that they did flesh out these demos so, I'm assuming, so passionately, because they slaved over a lot of the demos on this, and I think it shows, because when it came time to knock it out in the studio, I feel like, given how some of these songs came together, like if you look into the recording, you know, Dave Navarro and Flea were on You Ought to Know, and, they, and I guess they've talked about the experience, and it was it was different, you know, it was it was, it was a lot different than a lot of the execution that I feel like happens in a professional setting, just in the in the little bit of snippets I've had working in college uh, in, in higher end studios. But I respect a lot of the work that, that Glenn and Alanis had put into the writing and the, and the song composition on this record because they're doing a lot of different things, but they, they fit so very well. And what's interesting is that this record not only initially had this huge success, like, it won a lot of Grammys, won all the Grammys. Like, Alanis Morissette had the record for the youngest artists who had Grammys, especially this many. But it had so many singles. This album was, like, single after single after single for Alanis Morissette. Um, and it was just a big moment for her. But in in 2013, they made, a, they made an American Idiot out of this record. There's a stage musical for it. You know... A lot of these songs are in pop culture. You Oughta Know has been covered, I'm sure, countless times. I know Jonathan Colton did a really popular cover of it, or at least one that I had found. And again, there was the ir ironic thing that happened in the wake of the internet that when it came to really looking back on this record, people were like, ironic? It's not only that ironic of a song. But again, there's a stage play. There, there's a stage play for Jagged Little Pill. And I think that's incredible. I didn't know anything about it until I was looking into this, but it debuted in 2018. And apparently, it's an album, or it's a, a musical about pain, healing, and empowerment, which are the themes of the record. And I think that that's amazing, because it's not a, it's not an album with characters. It's not an American Idiot. It's not a Tommy. It's not an opera. It's not a musical. It's not a Coed and Cambria record. There's there's clearly lyrics that deal with personal things like Mary Jane and Perfect and dealing with all of these issues, you know, head over feet. But this record's lyrics do a good job at resonating past what may have been its initial inspiration of dealing with hardships as a woman, dealing with hardships, you know, in general, dealing with hardships in the woman in the music industry, or any any sort of overtly sexualization or anything that may have put someone down because of the sexuality. And it's become this bigger thing. And that's amazing. And I'm glad that it exists. I have not looked in, into it like clip-wise. But I don't think anybody would have ever, ever expected that, especially Landis, even if she's even, you know, gone into her own embracing of this record's classic status because she did an acoustic version of the record like 10 years later. She's doing a current tour 20 years later celebrating this record. It's, it's, it's a landmark achievement for her, and I'm, I'm happy that it exists. I'm happy that it's successful as it is. This has brought some cool stuff, and it's a record that I'll always hold near and dear right here. Uh, just right, right here. You know, that little... That little alt rock juggernaut. And that's my classic breakdown. If you follow the Patreon, another album won this vote, um, but there was such an, a, a resounding uh, plea in the rest of the polls for this record that I felt like I had to do it. I look at the Patreon votes, 
and anything unanimous, I feel like, should be tackled. And this won, but there was also interest for this in the Patreon on top of on Twitter and on YouTube. So I factored all of that in, and if those wanting the album that I didn't actually talk about, I'll end up doing that the next time I do a classic album breakdown, just because I don't want to leave you guys hanging. You know, those that, that support the Patreon, I take their support very seriously. But there is there was a, there was clearly a reason why a lot of you guys wanted me to talk about this record, and I appreciate that. I appreciate all the support that you guys have given me on here and on Patreon, and the feedback you guys give me. I really appreciate, and I'm always happy to sit down and talk about an album that I hold near and dear. And Jagged Little, Little Pill is one of those moments where it's not just an album that I love, but by a mass, a lot of people that like this record really love it, and I'm happy to share my love of it with you guys. But Either way, that's going to conclude this Let Me Tell You About. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a like. If you want to see more of my music, gaming, and general nerdery content, be sure to subscribe. Special thanks to my patrons if you would like to join their ranks, get early access to content, get exclusive content, and help drive the community. It's linked in the description. But either way, I have been Viral Rack. You guys are good days, lives, and situations. And I'll see you another day.